I'm going to get started because I think the people that aren't here have probably seen the beginning of the presentation already. Um, but yeah, hi, uh, David Vernay again. Um, I'm going to be talking about SCEDEX. Uh, I talked about this last year as well, so this is going to be more of a presentation on um, good to go okay. on uh, what's changed in the last year, um, kind of what the status is, what we're uh, what we've done, what also was what's still missing, both from the SCEDEX side and then of course also from the BPF side. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So yeah, what's the uh, background, current upstream status, all that fun stuff. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, uh, SCEDEX is a new scheduling framework in the Linux kernel that lets you implement CPU uh, host-wide scheduling policies as BPF programs. So just like any BPF program, you write a scheduler, or you write a program uh, in BPF, you compile it, load it onto the system, um, and then the core BPF, the core SCEDEX framework will uh, handle migrating all of the fair.c uh, tasks to use SCEDEX. Um, it'll handle monitoring it to make sure that you can't uh, wedge the system. The verifier will make sure that it's safe, just like it always does. Um, uh, there's no ABI stability restrictions. It's a kernel-to-kernel -kernel interface. So the scheduling APIs can and have changed. That's totally fine. Um, and it's GPL v2 only. So if you try to load a scheduler that isn't licensed with GPL v2, the verifier will not let you load it. Um, why do we do this? A uh, few benefits. One of, the, one of the biggest ones is rapid experimentation. If you want to try a new scheduling policy, you don't have to reboot the system. You don't have to recompile or reinstall the kernel. You just recompile the BPF program, load it. takes a few seconds, and uh, you can see how it does. Uh, at companies like Meta, where sometimes our, our experiments are really, really large, you know, 1,000 plus hosts, this is obviously really important and really useful for us. Um, and of course, like I said, it's safe. You can't crash the host. So you can really experiment. And if you have buggy schedulers and stuff like that, um, you should be fine, which is pretty cool. Um, you can also do bespoke scheduling policies. So you can implement scheduling policies that aren't general purpose, that aren't necessarily fair, but do get you really good returns. Um, we are already using uh, one such scheduler to run web and uh, meta, run HHVM. And we're also probably going to be rolling it out to some other workloads as well, such as ads and, um, and um, AIML, which is pretty cool. Uh, Valve and Agalia are already seeing, really, already seeing great results as well, which I'll talk about more later. Um, on P99 frame latency, so they're planning as well to ship a uh, scheduler, not really bespoke, it's actually a fair deadline scheduler, but they're planning to ship a scheduler as well on, uh, on the Steam Deck. Um, another benefit is you can move complexity into user space. Um, so core BP, one of the many core BPF features is of course maps, which lets you share information between user space and kernel space. So you can use that to collaborate. Um, we have schedulers that are hybrid schedulers. So we have hot paths in the kernel and then some more complicated stuff in user space like load balancing. Um, we have other schedulers that are actually almost exclusively in user space like SCX Rustland. Um, and they use the BPF ring buffers to have minimal overhead. So it's there for you, you know, but it doesn't matter in terms of ABI stability. It's still just kernel to kernel in terms of uh, what SCEDEX guarantees. So latest on upstream, um, the V6 patch set was sent in early May. Um, there's a link for it. There's still discussion, uh, but there's a lot to be excited about. Um, the community has really grown tremendously over the last year, which is, which is just awesome. Um, like I mentioned, Valve, uh, in cooperation with Egalia, are planning to ship a SCEDEX scheduler on the Steam Deck. Um, somebody from Egalia chimed in, actually the, the, the person who wrote uh, the scheduler chimed in, uh, expressing their support for it, so we're really happy about that. Um, Ubuntu is also considering shipping SCEDEX in the upcoming 2410 official release. So that would be huge, obviously. And then um, Andrea Riggi, who works at Canonical, um, has been writing a scheduler called SCX Rustland. That's the user space scheduler I mentioned that's, that's been doing really well, even though it's user space, um, which is super cool. Like I said, we're deploying uh, schedulers internally at Meta. Um, I guess that doesn't count as a community growing, but you know, it's still cool. Uh, and yeah, there's more people coming in seemingly every day. Chrome OS is, is apparently experimenting. Oculus is playing around with it on, on Android. So there's a lot of people that are using it at this point. Okay, so that's the background. That's kind of the latest upstream status. What's the latest and greatest in terms of what it can do? So in the core framework, um, a lot of stuff has changed. I think, in my opinion, the highlights, it's a lot easier to debug SCEDEX programs. So if you make a mistake, you have a buggy scheduler, and you, you drop a task on the floor, you forget to schedule it, eventually we'll notice that it's, it's not runnable or you haven't run it in too long of a time and we'll kick the scheduler out and print debug information on every run queue, which tasks are runnable, um, what, you know, how, much, how long were they there for, et cetera, et cetera. There are also hooks um, that you can implement that you can use to debug, to print out your own custom debug information. 
Uh, so that's been really helpful. Tejan added that. Um, there's also CPU Freak integration now, which Tejan also added. Um, and so this is great because it integrates with SCED Util, so it doesn't really sidestep anything that the scheduler already does. It just includes um, utilization from, uh, from, um, from SCEDX as well, and it gives you a few different K funks that let you do things like specify between uh, the value of uh, 1 to 1024, which is what SCED Util uses for other schedulers as well. You know, how fast should this, this uh, CPU be? Um, and so because of that, you don't, we don't have to worry about whether uh, we're running on different architectures and like what the CPU frequency governor is doing, it all just works. And all the pieces are now in place as well for per entity load tracking. So being able to calculate how much load a task has based on the power of the core that it's running on, we don't have support for that. We don't have a scheduler that does that yet, but I think everything is, is in place in case anybody wants to. Uh, we also have better semantics for dispatching. You can now dispatch uh, from the select CPU callback and not just in queue. Um, we've cleaned up a bunch of stuff. The API is tighter. New callbacks, uh, better hot plug support. And then, of course, on the BPF side, this is by f not at all an exhaustive list, but uh, much better local K pointer support. Um, and there's been a lot of work that's been done to add uh, backwards compatibility APIs. So we have schedulers that can run on 519 all the way up to the current uh, 6.9 kernel, which is pretty neat. Um, OK, so here's an example of the, uh, the debug stuff, uh, the, the latest debug um, output you get. So if you throw a stressor at the, uh, at the NPROC stressor at the, the host, and then you run Rusty, um, it's a buggy, this is a buggy version of Rusty where I've, I, I purposely made it not work. But yeah, you print out every task that's, that's runnable, um, print out its state, um, all these statistics. And if you wanted to, you could also print out extra information by implementing these, these ops in Rusty itself. So I know that it probably wasn't very easy to see what you actually get, but you get a lot. <laughs> all right, um, the schedulers themselves have also improved a lot. Um, SCX Rusty is the one that I've been focusing on the most. This is a work-conserving interactive hybrid scheduler. Um, like I was saying before, hybrid means that it has a user space portion and a kernel portion. And the user space portion does all the really crazy load balancing math. We're using floating point numbers. And um, it's stuff that we, you can do in the kernel. And, and uh, the core kernel, like fair.c, does do a lot of this stuff. But it's a lot easier to do it in user space. Um, but then all the hot path decisions are made in the kernel. So you don't really have. Uh, you don't really lose much because the load balancing is only done every one or two seconds. Um, so it's interactive, which means that it does really well with workloads that need super low latency for interactivity. So if you're using a desktop, feeling like it's responsive. If you're a server, feeling like, not feeling like, but uh, having uh, tasks that require low latency actually being served, even if there's longer running CPU hogging tasks on the system. It's pneumoware, and we're currently experimenting with it at Meta. Um, another meta uh, scheduler that we've written is called SCX Layered. And this is a scheduler that's really meant to be statically configured. So you give this, this scheduler a JSON configuration file, and that specifies, um, I won't go into too many details because it would probably take a while to explain, but you have this concept of layers, which tasks are put into layers according to various qualifiers. For example, you can say, for this layer, any task that has this name or this process name or this nice value the C group prefix, put it into this layer. And then you can also specify behavior for the layers. So this layer, which had the qualifiers I just mentioned, any task in this should always preempt a CPU if they can't find one. Or it should always be given um, you know, 20 CPUs on the system no matter what, but it can scale up to getting 60. So you can really configure it pretty, um, with pretty good granularity. And um, this has been really useful for us. Uh, this is what we're using to run web and some of the other workloads as well. Um, and in our experience, a lot of users that are kind of like, ah, oh, maybe we're just going to use RT because we really need this latency, but um, we're not getting it from fair.c. With layered, you don't, you don't have to worry about that because it's not a fair scheduler. It's fair in the fact that we use vTime, but if you, pre you, can, you can specify the, that a layer can just preempt and circumvent that. So it works well for that as well. Um, so some improvements to Rusty as well. Um, it's, it's changed deadlines. I mean, fundamentally changed DL scheduling is a little bit self-aggrandizing, so I wouldn't put too much weight into that. But um, it's different than how EVDF does it. Uh, EVDF, and I don't want to go too down into this rabbit hole, because this will take a while too, but EVDF decides deadline based on what's called task eligibility, which I won't talk about too much. But the deadline from there, let's just say that that's the current time, it's dictated by the slice length of the task inversely scaled by its weight. So tasks with a higher weight get earlier deadlines, and EVDF will choose the task to run with the earliest deadline. 
Um, but this is a little bit, uh, it, it works well in some cases, but the problem with this is that slice isn't necessarily the best thing to choose um, in terms of where, where to dictate a deadline because you don't really know how much CPU time you're gonna need before you get the CPU, which is what slice is essentially saying. Um, it's essentially your CPU request length. Um, you can configure slice, but configuring it is hard. Um, it's brittle, you know, like maybe a task needs this much CPU, but then something changes and it needs a little bit less, a little bit more. So instead, Rusty uses a few criteria. One of them is the, uh, how frequently a task blocks, which correlates with how much, uh, with, correlates with its role as a consumer. If a task blocks a lot, it's probably waiting for some work on a, sem on a, on a, a few texts or a semaphore. Um, same with waking. If a task wakes other tasks a lot, it's probably a producer task. And then um, also task average runtime. If a task runs for long periods of time, it's probably not an interactive task because usually interactive tasks need the CPU quickly and then they give it up because they, had, they were in some critical path for like rendering a frame or something like that. Um, something interesting to note that if you have both high blocking frequency and high waking frequency, you're probably in the middle of a task chain. And so um, I, I want to credit Chung Woo Min, who wrote the LAVD scheduler for figuring this out because it works really, really well. And this is completely, that one was all him. Um, but this is, really, this is a really important insight because if you think about Amdahl's law, if you, have a wake, if you have some task chain where you have a sequence of producers, consumers, and then people in the middle, which is really important for gaming, especially if you're running gaming on Wine and like Steam Deck, um, you can only optimize the, the rendering path by the length of that serial task chain, right? So if you can optimize that by giving them the CPU really quickly, you're actually improving the whole system regardless of what you're doing with the other you know, CPU hungry threads that may or may not be running. So um, instead, Rusty calculates the deadline by combining these wake frequencies and block frequencies, which are obviously a value between zero and one, um, inversely scaled by weight because you want an earlier deadline means you're gonna get the CPU more quickly. And then also you add the average runtime. And so if you have a task that runs for a long time, we're not gonna consider it as interactive as if you run for a short amount of time. Um, and so this works really, really well, it turns out. Um, we can throw a ton of CPU at the system. You can do K compile, you can stress NG, 4X NPROC, and like truly, I mean like way overload the system. And you wouldn't know it because you get to play your games and do whatever you want. Um, so here's an example of that. Um, yeah, so this is Terraria. This is a, a great game to show this kind of stuff. If we throw a ton of CPU at the system, uh, yeah, a ton of CPU at the system, uh, again, 4X NPROC, you can see that with EVDF, it's completely unplayable. The whole system actually becomes totally unusable. Um, but if you start Rusty, now it started, it's, you, you would have no idea that there's like a ton of work happening in the background. Um, and then, yeah, just to show that it still happens, if you turn it off, then the system, um, the system again becomes pretty unresponsive. Um, I should note as well that this actually probably has improved a little bit based on um, how eligibility was changed in 6.9. So it might be, this is tested on 6.8, so it might be different on 6.9. Um, but it works really well, um, is the point. And um, it actually, I don't know if I said this in the earlier slide, but it actually also does better for throughput, Rusty, because it's work conserving. So um, you can still get better kernel compile times, et cetera, as well, depending on what the workload is. All right, so the other schedulers, um, LAVD, one of the ones I mentioned, that's the one that was written by Chang Wu uh, at Egalia, and this is the one that they're gonna ship on the Steam Deck. Um, it works super well on Steam Deck. Um, and it's a little further than Rusty in certain ways, like it, it supports preemption, um, it has CPU frequency knobs and stuff like that, uh, but it's not NUMA or CCX aware, so it doesn't work on a lot of, uh, a lot of other you know, non-Steam Deck uh, host topologies. Uh, the other one I mentioned as well before, Rustland. Um, it's, it, even though it's, it has the overhead of going from user space to kernel space, it actually works really well. And you can, uh, Andrea has similar demos he showed with Terraria actually as well, I totally copied it, um, where he, he throws a bunch of, you know, of, uh, of work at the host and you can still play games um, using that one, which is, I think it's amazing that a, a user space scheduler can do that. All right, so also since last year, we've moved uh, the schedulers from the kernel tree into a separate repository. Um, the philosophy with this was, of course, to make it easier to iterate. Um, it's still licensed with GPL v2, of course. Uh, the philosophy that we have for this repo is it's a pretty low barrier to entry. If you want to submit your own scheduler, you know, you basically have right access to that. You can add what you want. You can get review reviews from us if you want, but, you know, it's up to you. We're not going to, like... We're not gonna nitpick or like tell you to change stuff. It's kind of, it's kind of up to you. Um, but then the, the trade-off is that people can take each other's ideas and implement them in their own schedulers. Um, 
and you know, uh, everybody, everybody hopefully wins. Uh, there's also some libraries and some crates that make it easier working with schedulers. Uh, for example, there's, there's a Rust crate called topology that, that views the host topology, builds some hierarchical Rust objects, and you can use that in your schedulers to determine, oh, how many L3 caches are there, how many NUMA nodes, and build objects that represent that accordingly. Um, all right, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, talk about what we still need. This is obviously very, very far from exhaustive, but just some few, a few things that I think might be interesting to discuss. Check time, okay. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we need more BPF, uh, shocker. Um, it's, so it's, I mean, it's incredible what you can do in schedulers already, but of course, there's still some things that are challenging to do, and I know that some of these problems are already being looked at. Um, you know, for example, you can't hold a spin lock around function calls. Um, that has been improved for subprogs, uh, but you know, if you want to make a kfunk call, even something like a CPU mask where there's nothing you have to worry about in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, you know, like whatever blocking anything like that, um, it's it's uh, you can't do that quite yet, and that of course makes it difficult to to you know, like, yeah, it makes it difficult to do stuff. Um, there's other random things that I know for sure people are working on, um, like if you have a struct inside of a struct and that struct, the nested struct has a K pointer, the verifier gets confused. Um, another really big one is uh, our, our stack sizes are getting hard to work within. Um, this is especially a problem for Google. Um, and I think this is also being worked on by, uh, by Yong Hong as well. So uh, I guess I'm not really complaining, it's more just pointing out what needs to be done. Um, let's see, um, another big one, which also could be addressed by arenas, but um, I think we have to probably think about exactly how it'll look is being able to read and write uh, thread and cgroup local storage from user space. Uh, this is gonna be important for your current thread. For example, let's say that you take a spin lock in user space. I mean, we know how, how Linus feels about that and I completely agree with him, but if you can tell the scheduler, I actually have a spin lock, so you should really give me the CPU unless you have a great reason not to, then that, that problem actually becomes kind of less serious. Um, so you can do interesting stuff like that and then also, uh, if you have a single thread that's like your user space scheduler thread, the one that loaded the BPF program, after it's loaded, it just becomes kind of its own thread. Um, maybe that thread is gonna read everybody else's thread local storage value for determining load and doing load balancing. So there's a lot of stuff there that's really useful. Again, some of this might be, might be, uh, be done already. Um, and you know, I think a lot of these programs, like a lot of these problems, like usability, it's, it's, it's gonna be helpful for everybody, so this isn't really news. Um, yeah, libbpfrs, um, it can be tricky just because you're passing references around. Also just kind of a Rust thing, so I don't know if there's much to do about that. And then um, uh, another, we so another thing we want to do, um, in user space, you'll often reference objects in vmlinux.h. For example, let's say that you have an enum um, that's defined in the kernel and you want to look at the value and a scheduler exits with some enum value. Um, you can just you know, hard code the value or look at a vmlinux.h file, but it would be awesome if we could instead have some build process where um, you take the vmlinux.h output, which Rust creates Rust bindings for, and you could actually tie that into libbpf so that you use the libbpf functions for looking up the value of the enum on the host. And so that would allow the kernel to change enum values without violating backwards compatibility for schedulers that hard code, um, hard code you know, an enum value uh, for whatever scheduler they, they compiled against. So that would be nice for, for core. So, you know, I mean, like, that's actually not, like, I, I feel like you would expect to, there to be a lot more blockers, and there, are, there is a lot of stuff that we could still do, but actually the situation on the BPF side I think is really, really encouraging. It's, 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 it's amazing how far it's come. Um, I, you know, the, the biggest thing that we need, I think, is uh, people working on schedulers. Um, there's a lot of people that are, that are using SCEDX now, which is awesome, but in terms of people that can actually iterate on the schedulers themselves, instead of using them and reporting uh, regressions and stuff like that, that's, uh, that's kind of a, uh, more difficult to find, so anybody who's interested in working on schedulers and BPF and the, you know, the beautiful marriage of the two can, we, can uh, feel free to join uh, SCEDX. Um, yeah, parentheses load tracking, like I said, and we have a we have a self test framework for the core SCEDX kernel, but we don't have one for the actual schedulers themselves. So that's something that could also be interesting for people. Um, in terms of the core SCEDX features that we're looking to implement, one of the ones that's uh, really cool, which is blocked on the stack the stack work for BPF that I pointed to before, is allowing um, attaching a scheduler to a specific C group and having a hierarchy of a hierarchy of schedulers in the system. 
So you can imagine you have a root, the root C group that has a scheduler that determines which sub C group gets to, that gets to make the decision for some resched, and then that one could have you know, sub C groups where it calls into them to make a decision. And in doing this, um, this is obviously kind of a crazy idea, but it would allow us to do stuff like have per process schedulers without having to have um, do something like UMCG, like what, what, uh, what, what's, what's been done before. And so if you had a user space framework like, uh, like, like Folly or, or, um, or Go or whatever, you could have fibers interact directly with, with the scheduler for that process and do things like if you have a, an executor that's doing really short-lived work items, pin it to a core because you know that it's gonna be fast to do it and you're gonna get good cache locality and stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's a big project that's kind of down the road that we're looking at. Um, other things, um, we found that in certain cases, if you, if you tune CPU frequency really well and you get you know, turbo on a core that's doing really important work, what you want, then you start to run into bottlenecks elsewhere in the system like uncore frequencies, so like memory controller and stuff like that. Um, something else that comes up a lot is uh, idle policy. So if you have a workload that can benefit a lot from not going into deep C states, um, you can maybe have that be part of the scheduler. This one's kind of weird though because um, Currently, like idle policies are really separate from the scheduler, even without SCEDX in the picture. Uh, this is something that you can specify at boot time and you can also change dynamically, but fair.c, SCEDX, that's been separate, but I, I'm not convinced that they should be, so that's something else to think about. And then um, uh, Vineeth and Joel, uh, Vineeth presented earlier on this paravert scheduling. That's something that I think could be really interesting to look at as well, which is obviously much more um, BPF specific. And like I've said, I think a big area that BPF could potentially have like huge impact in um, for VM workloads. And then of course the other thing is, um, you know, join the upstream conversation. If you, if you feel one way or the other, um, the more people that, that are participating, uh, the better. Um, you know, I think it's eventually gonna be users that get it upstreamed, uh, maybe. Um, you know, and it's just in general, like the more, the more input you get, the better. So, that's kind of where we're at so far. Latest with SCEDX. Um, thoughts, critiques, compliments. Any comments or questions? No compliments. Jam huh? Jam packed. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing was unclear. Okay. All right. So cool. on the core BPF side, like, what are like next? features you're working on that are yeah. to be sent to the list at some point? I think, well, so I think the stack, like the stack allocation for VPF programs is probably the big one. Um, because if you have this nested hierarchy of, hierarchy of struct ops programs, you're gonna need to have a stack that's specific for that, right? Because you're gonna run out of stack space if you're making function calls from like the root C group down to some child C group like six layers deep. Um, also, the idea of attaching a struct ops program to a C group itself is a different idea. I think right now every C group, every struct ops program is global. It's a singleton. I don't know if that's true for TCP congestion actually, but um, that's something that I think we'll probably want to think about if we need to make that, um, you know, a generic idea, or if we can kind of work within the framework already, or if it's something that we could just do for in SCEDX and not bother the rest of BPF. But to me, those are the those are the big two, and then um, just you know, really just usability, like having a, you know, like a lot of people. One, one thing that a lot of people ask is, oh, can you do EVDF in in SCEDX? And the answer is no, because you just can't. Like if you can't uh, call a K funk while you're holding a lock, you just can't do it. Um, uh, I mean, maybe you could if you like really structure the program in a certain way, but like one thing that EVDF does is they have this rolling average V runtime value that they have per run queue. And so if you wanted to have that per domain instead of per run queue, you would have to take a lock um, and then inspect what the, God, this is not worth this, <laughs> but you have to look at, uh, look at the task that's at the head of the, the dispatch queue that corresponds to your run queue, look at its V time, and then you update the average V time accordingly because that's the min V time because it's the head of the queue. So not, not important, but um, that just the lack of ability to call k funks with, with spin locks is, uh, it's, you just run into problems where you can't do certain things. You, you can work around them and you can have heuristics where you converge and in practice it works pretty well. Um, but you know, like some of these schedulers are like thousands of lines long. So it's eventually you just, you just like, it's painful not to be able to do that. So I had a question. When some people hear schedulers and BPF, they think this, this is going to give them huge performance wins for generic workloads. It sounds like a lot of the use cases are looking at 
scheduling latency percentiles so that you can ensure things like 60 frames per second, or, or and that has its use cases. What are your thoughts on uh, tail end latency versus generic latency and the opportunities here? Well, so um, I think you can get both tail latency and just like generic latency. Uh, for, for gaming in particular, they really care more about P99 latency just because like that's when you notice the stutter, then the game is over, right? But you know, with, with SCEDX, like you can do things dynamically. So the Rusty scheduler, one thing I didn't mention is that if the system is overloaded, I actually decrease the slice length to, um, to one millisecond, whereas, whereas if it's underloaded, it's 20 milliseconds, so that CPU hogging tasks can run for a really long time, and they don't have to worry about starving the CPU from, from the interactive tasks. So I think, you know, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see, but I think we could actually just win on every front if we're if we're able to like use the the freedom of being able to experiment and, and change fundamentally. You work with user space in certain cases, right? Um, so, in terms of like tail latencies versus general latency, I think that using a, using a deadline scheduler that's informed by this interactivity factor and average runtime probably addresses both pretty well. Um, the fact that it's work conserving addresses throughput pretty well. So, but yeah, you know, it's like one thing I've learned is that you can design something that you think works well and it does maybe in certain scenarios, but then there's a benchmark where it just gets blown out of the water by, by another scheduler and you just have to go look and you're like, oh, okay, so this, this benchmark is just hammering the run queue with like, like 100 byte IPCs and like all it's doing is just run queuing, right? And so, okay, well, I mean, we could optimize for that, but maybe, maybe it's not worth it. But I think, yeah, in general, I mean, like, Sure, right, why not? Let's aim for, aim for the sky. I mean, why not might be that there's been a lot of development on generic latency in the existing schedulers for decades. Well, That's EVDF is, is new though, right? That, that only landed in 6.7, six, six, I think. So EVDF is a concept, the paper landed in 95, but um, I actually think that, late, I mean, obviously people have been working on latency in Linux for quite a while, but um, you know, that was added in response to the latency nice patches that Vincent added, go ahead. Uh, just a, uh, uh, what I want to give is a preview to OSPM. In like two, three weeks, we're going to be at the OSPM conference in Toulouse, France, which is like a scheduler power management. And just FYI, we did a EEVDF uh, running on Chromebooks in the field. And so far, uh, the, we got some great results on tail latencies. It brought it down tremendously. Which version of EEVDF is it? Uh, or like which kernel? Yeah, sorry. It was, okay. Well, we had to backport it to 5.15. <laughs> so we, nice. we backported, and this is also with the um, uh, use of uh, tweak to turn off eligibility checks. Okay, that's what I was gonna ask, because eligibility um, hurts latency, actually, because, yes. yeah, so. And there's a, there's a patch upstream that we're gonna look at that wants to do it on, ignore eligibility on wake up. So okay. just on wake up, not totally. See, so the, the, the problem though is right, like eligibility in EVDF is what they use to bound lag. Mm -hmm. So you can turn it off, but um, I mean at that point, yeah, sure, I guess you could, but like it requires a lot of like expertise to get it right. 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 So I think like ideally like the perfect scheduler could just look at what's going on in the system and adjust itself according to like what the system is doing and make it just work for the user, right? Yep. So I don't want to hijack the BPF uh, track here. This is just saying this is what we'll be discussing in OSPM. No, no, it's it's important too because yeah, it's uh, there's a reason it's the kernel scheduler. Great. And the last thing is, if you're getting into this, I, I get going from the the current schedulers, whether it's CFS or something else, to BPF. Has someone ported the current schedulers to BPF so that I can begin with? the same, basically the same thing, and then I can start tweaking? Uh, okay, if I had a nickel for every time I was asked that, I would have, yeah. It's a great question, obviously. Um, so the short answer is that we don't have like an EVD, like SCX EVDF yet. I actually did implement something that was per, per domain, but the problem with EVDF, and I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this, is that it really does need like fully synchronized math in order for it to work. Um, so they have this average runtime value that's running that they calculate. They change min v runtime, and uh, I, I can't explain it from here. But the short answer is that until we have the ability to call k funks with locks, we we literally just can't do what they're doing. Um, I think the reason that, so the reason this question is asked a lot is because I think a lot of people would want to use SCEDX to try something with EVDF, see if it works, and then they go add it to EVDF fair.c, right? Which would be great. That's like the perfect. That's like the like 
you know, like the, the poster child of like why we think it's a useful tool, even regardless of the bespoke schedulers or anything like that. Um, and I, I think it'd be awesome if somebody did that. And I think we can get relatively close even without, um, even without the capabilities that we need right now with like the spin locks. Uh, but we do have a whole bunch of, I mean, we have deadline schedulers, VTime. Fundamentally, an EVDF bandwidth is implemented with VTime and it's the same as what we use for most of our schedulers. So the bandwidth part of it is kind of already the same. But yeah, for latency, um, it would be just, it would be fantastic if you could use this to experiment and, and then contribute right back to the kernel. You don't even have to maybe upstream what you're doing to EV, the SCX one if you don't want to. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.